Hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar hosted by the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. My name is Victor Trinidad with NCPMI. This webinar is part of the Unpacking Coaching webinar series. Today's topic is One Size Doesn't Fit All, Using a Tiered Coaching Model in ECE. Today's presenters are Jennifer Cunningham, Shauna Harbin, Mackenzie Weintraub, and Ashley McNish. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Thank you, Victor. My name is Ashley McNish, and I'm happy to be hosting today's webinar. Um, for those of you who have been following along with our Unpacking Coaching series this year, um, you may have noticed we've kind of been doing um, different uh, coaching delivery models um, within the PBC framework. And so I'm really excited today to have some uh, presenters with us who um, have worked on the tiered coaching model. And um, it's just a really great way if you have uh, knowledge of PBC and the different delivery models to think about how to individualize the coaching supports you provide to practitioners. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves and then we'll get started. So Shauna, why don't we start with you? Hello, my name is Shauna Harbin. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Washington. And um, as part of the TCM project, I was a coach. So I worked in um, with all levels of coaching. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mackenzie Weintraub, and I am an early childhood education consultant. And I was a coach for one year during the design stage of the tiered coaching model. Jenny, I'll pass to you. Thanks, Mackenzie and Shauna. My name is Jenny Cunningham. I'm a researcher at the Herring Center for Inclusive Education at the University of Washington. And I'm also the project coordinator for our tiered coaching model um, development project at the University of Washington. Um, and so I'm excited to share, be the person to share some background about the tiered coaching model and a little bit about the framework um, and then really release it to our two coaches, Mackenzie and Shauna, to share and reflect on um, what using that model uh, felt like in their uh, interactions with practitioners over the years that they have um, been using it. So uh, we just did our introductions. As I said, I'm gonna go over what is the tiered coaching model, kind of do a zoomed out view of what we consider to be the framework for the tiered coaching model. Talk to you a little bit about some of the considerations um, that you can take into account when we're doing, when you're doing what we call the coaching match. So doing that individualization process that Ashley was talking about. Um, and we have some tools and support around communicating that with teachers and making those decisions um, in partnership with teachers. Um, and then we're gonna move on to some discussion questions with our two coaches um, and, and answer any questions that you all have. Uh, so as I said, or as Ashley mentioned, the uh, tiered coaching model is not necessarily a new coaching delivery format. It takes practice-based coaching delivery formats and puts them into a framework that allows coaches and programs to consider how they're going to um, be efficient and effective with their delivery of coaching and responsive to individual teacher differences, preferences, and classroom needs. Um, so we all know this from, from being with practitioners, being in the classroom ourselves, not every classroom and not every practitioner needs the same type of support or will feel um, as supported by different types of coaching. And so the tiered coaching model was designed to help give a little bit of a framework, a decision-making model for how we might take information that we can get from teachers about their classroom experiences, their preferences around coaching, their previous um, satisfaction with professional development and coaching, as well as their strengths and needs within their classroom practices. Take that all together to make decisions about the types of coaching that we, we might be able to um, deliver to them or provide to them. And I want to share here um, that, oops, sorry, one, one back, one second, Ashley, that was my fault. I paused. <laughs> 
The TCM project is an IES funded project. We're in a, we're a development and innovation grant project. So the past four years have been dedicated to thinking about what are the different pieces of information we need about teachers? What does it look like to implement this in classrooms? Um, and that is a project that is led by Dr. Angel Fedig and Dr. Kathleen Artman Meeker. Um, so I'm here representing um, that work today, um, but you can um, learn more information about them and our project and some of the, the handouts and our, our website. Thanks, Ashley. So here is just a zoomed out view of the different um, types of coaching or the different parts of the tiered coaching model in terms of the delivery methods that we might use um, with practitioners within the tiered coaching model. Um, and so as Ashley said, a lot of these are things that if you've been following along with this webinar series or if you're familiar um, with practice-based coaching, these have components that you'll be familiar with. So these aren't new formats of coaching. They're just the structures that we think about um, for the types of coaching that practitioners might receive. And um, we do this around the pyramid model specifically. So I'm gonna talk about each of these um, in more detail, but you can see that there are um, different levels that are both different in terms of how we're interacting with um, practitioners, how often, and, and what the structure of that is. So we have a self-guided coaching option that really is about um, uh, regular check-ins with the teacher, but the teacher is setting their own action plans and consulting with the coach, but there's less regular um, in the classroom contact. There's small group coaching, which you've heard a lot about in this, these webinars and seen some um, background information on before that have uh, meetings of uh, professional learning communities, meetings of teachers together, or practitioners together along with the coach to work on action plans. And then individualized coaching, uh, which is our very kind of classic practice-based coaching where a coach is working in the classroom um, with a practitioner or in whatever early learning setting that they're in um, on a weekly basis in a very individualized way. Um, and we always like to start our description of the tiered coaching model by highlighting that in all levels of the TCM, so no matter what type of coaching a practitioner um, is engaging in with their coach, there are some common elements um, that are designed to make sure that everyone's getting kind of a universal base level of support. And so regardless of the type of um, coaching that a teacher is matched to, and again, I'll talk about that matching process and what exactly that looks like um, in just a moment, everyone's getting a consistent contact with a coach. So even those teachers in kind of a more self-guided, self-initiated um, coaching uh, level are getting a cons have a consistent single coach that they're in touch with and that they have access to and support from. We're using practice-based practice -based coaching principles and action planning throughout all levels of the model. So no matter where a teacher is within that uh, level, we are using those principles of selecting a practice, engaging in guided reflection, and action planning um, around, in our case, pyramid model practices. And everybody always has access to initial workshop training and materials and resources to support implementation. So these are things like um, making sure that everybody has access to uh, visuals in the classroom or everyone has access to pyramid model kits if that's something that your program is um, investing in or has in, has in your um, in your coaching practice. And then everyone also receives uh, monthly newsletters from the coaching team. So regardless of what kind of coaching you're getting or what practices you happen to be working on at that time in your coaching context, if you're a practitioner, you're receiving regular updates with new ideas and new resources around the pyramid model. So those core components are consistent across all the tiers, um, each level of, of the tiered coaching model. So I'm gonna quickly explain what happens at each level. What we really wanna focus on today is what is that framework for helping you think about, well, how do I decide what kind of coaching each of my teachers would benefit the most from? How do I go about it from a programmatic perspective? Because I would imagine many of you are coaching more than just one teacher and you have kind of some logistical things to consider around the different levels of coaching each of the practitioners that you're working with might be supported by. So I'm gonna quickly go over what we uh, incorporate in each of these um, tiers of coaching, but I wanna emphasize that 
the format and the, the, what you consider to be uh, or how you use each of these is probably going to be a little unique um, to your program. And so it's really thinking about what are the different kinds of coaching my program can offer and then how do I make decisions about um, how to place teachers with uh, practitioners within those tiers of coaching. So again, everybody's getting that universal coaching workshop, newsletters, and contact and check-in with a coach. In our self-guided coaching, um, what this looks like is practitioners have an initial goal-setting meeting with the coach where they identify high-priority practices that they are wanting to work on in the coming weeks and months. Uh, the coach walks them through a self-guided action planning tool um, that they use to continuously check in with themselves and engage in that practice-based cycle of identifying a practice, reflecting on current use, identifying how they will um, uh, action plan and do that within their classroom and reflect on its impact on their classroom and, and the children in their classroom. And this is the, that self-guided action planning is happening uh, within the teacher, within the practitioner um, ongoing and then at least monthly there is a zoom or an in-person check-in with the coach where the coach is is available and working with uh, the practitioner on their whatever action plan they're currently focusing on and in our small group coaching option um, we have three to five teachers and a coach that meet in our our case in our projects this has been twice a month again this might be something that looks a little different in your program maybe it's once a month maybe it's three times a month um, but it's the focus is on um, creating those professional learning communities where small groups of teachers can get together and again engage in that exact same cycle. So they're engaging together as a group in reflection, providing each other with feedback on um, the implementation of the practices within their classroom along with the coach and engaging in some group problem solving around implementation between um, their coaching sessions. Uh, it follows a, a structure that you can learn about um, in some of these previous webinars and, and uh, materials that are available on the NCPMI website, um, but it follows the structure of the coach um, delivering a little bit. We, we make a rule, five slides. This is, isn't meant to be a lecture or uh, a presentation by any means. It's a quick uh, sharing of information to have a, a shared content uh, topic to talk about together, some kind of brainstorming learning activity for the group to do together, and then each uh, practitioner has the opportunity to action plan and share their action plan around with the group. And then the next time that they return together, um, there's a teacher who brings in a video clip of themselves trying the practice, a journal entry of from themselves about how the practice went and what they noticed, data maybe that they collected on their own implementation and with children. Um, and the group works together to think about how do we continue to enrich that practice. And they get to know each other's classrooms and opportunities for also that peer support and interaction within that. And then the last type of coaching within the model that we use is individualized coaching. And if um, you all are, are using practice-based coaching or one-on-one -on -one coaching, this will feel the most familiar, I would imagine. This involves weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings um, with the teacher. It involves live coaching observations. And if you can be in person, in vivo support, although we got to do um, a really wide range of hybrid versions of this over the last two years and zoomed into classrooms and, and we're, we're talking to teachers while they were on Zoom in their classrooms. Um, so I think we learned a lot this year about uh, the different ways that um, this might look, but it always involves these co core components of a live observation, opportunities for the coach and the, and the practitioner to engage in a debrief, reflection, and action planning um, again. I just saw someone pop up in the chat that they are here from Montgomery County, Maryland, and that's where I am from. So that was an exciting thing to see. Uh, welcome. Uh, we can go on to the next one, Ashley. So again, those are our three uh, types of coaching. If you're interested in what each of those coaching structures look like, there are lots of materials about practice-based coaching delivery methods available as Ashley said, previous webinars and on NCPMI. Uh, but what we want to, I want to focus on today and get uh, Shauna and uh, Mackenzie to share with us is things about how we kind of for ourselves think about what does it look like to match teachers? We call it a match day when we're making our decisions within our group where we're thinking about taking what we've learned about teachers and making a decision about their coaching. Um, and then what does it really feel like to implement it and do a different kind of coaching maybe with different sets of teachers within your program? So what you see on the screen here is a visual of 
the kinds of pieces that come together to make a match. And I always like to emphasize when I'm talking about this that sometimes when we set this up, it kind of sounds like what I'm about to share with you is a, a formula for how you decide. So you put X information in and it spits out what type of coaching teachers and practitioners should engage in. And it's really um, not formulaic in that way. There are guiding pieces that I will share with you today, but there is, um, is not a specific cutoff score on the teapot that says that you should get this kind of coaching or this kind of coaching, or a specific response that you might give in a in, uh, conversation or a survey um, that might uh, automatically mean that you should be in a certain kind of coaching. It really is a comprehensive look at both individual teachers' classroom strengths, their preferences and goals, and their specific classroom needs that year. We all know classroom compositions, kiddos, circumstances look diff different every year. Um, so it's kind of both a, a piece about the practitioner and then the moment in time in which coaching is starting um, and what they need um, uh, in terms of support. And it also takes into consideration that, as I said, you all are looking at this from a programmatic perspective. There are only so many hours in the day and days in the week um, and teachers on your, uh, practitioners on your coaching caseload if you are a coach or an administrator. And so the second level of this is thinking logistically, what are the goals for my program? And then how do I use that information about individual teachers' needs to make decisions about how I'm distributing um, different coaching dosages and levels and types. So as I said, we call this uh, making a match um, in, our, in, our, in our group, um, and we create match memos for teachers, and there should be an example of that available um, on, on the webinar materials, um, where uh, we communicate to teachers what we learned about them and why we're making the recommendation about the match that we're making. So when we are making that match, we, we have a few things to consider. Uh, a really important one is practitioner preference. So we share with practitioners what the different types of coaching are that are available, and we ask them what sounds like it would be most supportive to you in the way that you learn. And that's obviously really impactful. Practitioners know themselves best. They have been in school, they've been in professional development, they've probably received coaching before, so they probably have a pretty good sense of what feels most supportive to them. Uh, on our projects, we deliver a survey um, to get some information from teachers, um, to get information about their preference and their previous experiences and perspectives. This might be something that you do in conversation with teachers. Maybe you have a list of questions that you want to ask to gain some information about their preferences and how they've been coached in the past and if and how uh, they have different levels of satisfaction with different kinds of support that they've received. We also ask questions about stress level, stress around behaviors in the classroom, um, how currently um, effective and confident they feel in, in supporting children's challenging behaviors in the classroom and supporting their um, positive behavior. Um, and then we look specifically at uh, classroom strengths and needs, and we do that through the teapot, the teaching pyramid observation tool, which as you all know, goes alongside with the pyramid model. Um, and that gives us a sense of where a, a practitioner is starting in terms of their pyramid model practices. Um, and you can see in, uh, uh, that, or you will, um, you know, can probably predict that when we are making our decisions, we are thinking about teachers, uh, practitioners who have relatively low teapot scores and, and, and need some support around getting some of those foundational practices in place might need to start with some more intensive individualized weekly coaching to get some of those practices in place. And our teachers who are already um, using practices at a pretty high fidelity, those might be our teachers that are eligible in combination with some of this information to be in more of that self-guided action planning um, level of coaching. And then we also, again, think about logistics. So the number of teachers that you have, how much um, in your program, how much uh, time the coach has to distribute across those and scheduling. Um, and so these are all pieces that go together into deciding what kind of coaching um, a teacher or a practitioner might get. Um, and so just a few um, uh, notes about that. Actually, actually, we can move on to the next um, slide. I think this has some of that information. So on that match memo, uh, what we provide is information about each of those pieces to the teacher when we're making those decisions. 
Um, and as I said, there are no specific cutoff points for these. So the way that I would think about it in terms of this first box here for teapot um, and using the teapot to guide your decisions around um, uh, placement of, of a practitioner in a coaching model would be to think about what's your program's goal for a fidelity level? Have you identified a, a teapot score level that your goal over the course of the year is to move everybody's uh, practices towards, whether that's 80%, 75%, what your team has identified as the goal for practice implementation of the pyramid model. And then you can work backwards from there. You can say, here's this group of teachers that I have. I have 10 teachers. About five of them are already using practices at about that level. A few of them are using practices in the mid-range, and one or two of them are, are, are needing some more foundational support to start moving towards that fidelity goal level that we've set for our program. That's a first way to think about how you might be kind of looking at the framework of teacher of practitioners that you have to start thinking about what levels of support might I need to give in order to move us all towards this goal of a fidelity marker that we've set. And then we take a look at things that we might have learned from delivering a survey or having a convert uh, an intentional um, uh, planned conversation with teachers about what do they prefer, uh, how, um, how are they feeling about uh, challenging behavior in their classroom, what are their stress levels in the classroom, um, and we use that information to say if our teachers are, you know, feeling pretty confident, they have, they're already uh, um, using practices at that higher level of fidelity, um, and they're not experiencing currently a lot of stress around challenging behavior in their classroom, then maybe self-guided coaching is a good place for them to start. We have teachers who are in that middle range of implementation and also experiencing a lot of stress and may benefit from the support of a peer community around those experiences in their classroom. That might be an indication that that small group coaching is a good place for them. And then our teachers who, again, are needing more support around that foundational level of implementation um, and are indicating that they would prefer to have someone come in and give that initial intensive, they're feeling not very confident in how they're using their practices around challenging behavior and positive behavior support, that individualized one-on-one -on -one more intensive coaching um, may be the best fit for them. So we're really, again, as you can see, taking a couple things into consideration. So we recommend starting by looking at the kind of spread of teapot scores and what that looks like for your program, and then like taking that individual information that you have about teachers to make a best first decision about what you would recommend for a type of coaching for them, taking your, your logistics into account you probably can't run five different small group coaching sessions every week. So what does that look like? How could you divide things up or move teachers in and out of different that accommodates the logistical constraints that you might have from the days of the week and the hours that we have in a day? Um, and so again, you should be able to see an example of what that memo is and the kind of information we provide to teachers about, um, about their, their coaching match. We can go to oh, Jennifer, um, I have a really quick question. Well, hopefully yes. it's a quick question. <laughs> I know that you cannot share uh, the survey example, but do you have some examples maybe of like the types of questions you would encourage coaches and programs to put together if they were to create a survey? Yeah. And so I think that the ones that we highlight are around um, what types of coaching have you received in the past? Uh, kind of rating on a scale of one to five, how uh, supportive did that type of coaching uh, feel in the past? Uh, asking questions about, um, you know, again, these we did it on rating scales of how about um, different uh, components of the classroom that might contribute to stress, so challenging behavior in the classroom. How, um, you know, how 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 are you experiencing that on a scale of one to five levels of stress around that? Um, and quest questions about preference. So again, giving that information, given this information, what kind of coaching do you think would be most supportive? Um, and then asking questions about their goals for um, what they'd like to work on for the year and what are their priorities for their classroom, I think are all kind of core important pieces of information to ask. Great question. So we talked about this a little that we have um, a memo that we share that there is that example where we walk through kind of what went into our recommendation that we're making for teachers. 
Um, we make sure that we share this using a preferred method of communication. So we ask teachers within that um, initial, converse, initial uh, conversation survey, learning about what's their preferred method of communication. Do they like to have that information sent and have time to digest it and then come back with questions? Do they like to have an immediate live conversation? Is a phone call better? So identifying with each teacher what the best way to communicate that is for them, making sure um, that we're explaining that the coaching level will change over time depending on their needs. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to that next in describing that um, this initial match is just that, an initial match where we give it a try, we see how things progress, we see how um, uh, practitioners are feeling, are they feeling supported, is this working for them, and if not, or if we are seeing uh, lots of progress and we're ready to try something new, or if we are a little stuck on an action plan and it doesn't feel supportive, we might try something, something else in a different direction, more intensive or a different dosage or a different uh, structure. Maybe you know, moving into small group coaching because it feels like a peer support might be more supportive for that teacher. So the key about this is that it is responsive both in its initial match to what teachers are needing, but it's also responsive as the year changes and goes on. And we'll talk a little on the next slide about what might um, uh, cause us to say, oh, it might be time to try something new or different um, in this classroom. And uh, we always like to emphasize here the importance of being sensitive with communicating with teachers about the match and making sure that practitioners understand that this process does take each of those components that I described into account um, when we're making decisions about uh, initial match or movement among the different levels of coaching. Um, and being clear that being assigned to a certain level is not punitive, nor is it an indication or should be conveyed to them as an indication that it's something that they need to work their way out of or that they are um, that there's you know a reason that they have to be at one level or the other that is about their implementation of practices that we really emphasizing that this is about a fit around both needs, strengths, and um, how we're approaching uh, supporting using those pyramid practices in the classroom. And so the last thing I'll, I will share before we move into questions for Mackenzie and Shauna and from you all um, is just what I was saying before about when um, and how to make decisions about um, trying different types of coaching with teachers. So we think about this as a, as a check-in point where we say, are we gonna stick with what we're doing or are we gonna try something new with practitioners? So again, this touch point is gonna be different based on your calendar year? Are you a full year round program? Are there different things going on mid year that would say like, let's not add another teapot or another class into the into the mix. So what this timeline looks like will be specific to your program. We do it about every eight to 10 weeks. And we look at things like is progress being made on the action plans? Are we seeing some change in key the, the key item scores um, that teacher that practitioners and coaches had identified being priority goals for their fidelity check-ins. Have we seen a decrease in some of those red flag items, those practices that kind of go, um, that aren't going to be supportive of children's um, behavior and social emotional development? Um, and then talking, talking to our educators, talking to our practitioners, what does this feel like? How is this going? Do you want to try something else? And we take, again, take all of this together to make decisions about if we're progressing, things are going great, the teachers feel really supported, we might stay right where we are. If we're stagnant, if we're not making, making progress on action plans, we would have a discussion about what could be a different approach that we could try that would be more supportive. And this is really done in partnership with teachers and um, practitioners. And I'll be excited for Mackenzie um, and Shauna, and I know Mackenzie experienced this specifically with teachers moving in different directions within the, the model and, and having some real open reflections about what that meant for them and how it felt. Um, and so uh, this is very much done in partnership um, with the teachers. And then the last slide here just identifies that you might have your check-in points. Um, if we go one more forward, Ashley, um, you might have your check-in points and then also things might happen. New classroom staff might get added. A new kiddo might come in or, or something might happen where the intensity of a kiddo's challenging behavior starts to really ramp up and, and a teacher or a practitioner feel would feel more supported if someone was coming in and doing some of that in-person coaching with them. And so this is just yet another piece to show that it is not all about teapot cutoff scores, that the goal of the TCM is to take a look at the teacher, 
the practitioner themselves, their classroom, and what's happening in that moment and how we can respond as coaches um, to be as, as supportive as we can be of them. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley uh, to ask some of our coach panel questions to Shauna and Mackenzie um, and, and hear from you all. Um, yeah, and before I transition to our coach uh, panel, Jenny, we had a great question from the audience and I was gonna ask if we need it, if we had more time anyway. So I'll just ask now, since it's more of a pro programmatic implementation type question is, Who's involved in the matching process? Is it just the coach making these decisions? Uh, does program leadership, is the administrator involved? Um, especially concerns in making sure teachers have time um, in case they have to meet the coach outside of the classroom. You know, those, yes. all those things we have to think about. <laughs> Absolutely. That is a, a really important question about what does this look like in real life and, and in, a, in a program. And um, a couple of responses to that. I think that it is important to set up um, clear boundaries around who the teacher is sharing the information with about their preferences, their previous PD experiences, satisfaction, that we're creating a safe space for coaches and practitioners to be having those conversations so that there isn't a risk of them feeling like different things could be punitive or they might get in trouble or or anything like that that it's a safe you know partnership space to be discussing their needs within the classroom but to your point about the level that leadership needs to be involved from the design perspective is really important for both the coach coaches time to be released to have enough time to prep for and accommodate the different kinds of coaching that they're delivering and to make sure that there are systems in place, as you say, that they understand what kind of coaching different teachers are getting in different buildings or different programs that they can be responsive with a plan that allows teachers to come out of the classroom um, and be engaged in the different kinds of coaching. Um, and as you can probably tell, the small group coaching one has the biggest logistical features. There's there's the matter of getting one teacher out of the classroom for a 15 minute debrief. There's a whole other matter of getting three teachers out of the classroom together uh, to have that meeting with their coach. And so that is a really key piece. So you might decide within your program that maybe which individual teachers are matched to what stays within the context of the coaching partnership, but that at the design level and the logistical level leadership is a full awareness of the different levels of coaching that are being offered and available so that they can be supportive of that from a programmatic perspective great thank you jenny yeah communication is so important i know that's where um things like coaching contracts and things are really helpful to too in supporting those conversations um, so I'm really excited now um, to hear from our coaches who have done or used the tiered coaching model um, in their work. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Mackenzie, um, and this is kind of a multi-level question. How does it feel managing different types of coaching and communication? And do you have any tips for someone who may be coaching multiple uh, delivery styles at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, um, it felt really good to meet practitioners' needs and to provide kind of a good fit for coaching support. Um, so it was kind of exciting to try something that felt a little bit different um, and be able to individualize. And as a coach, being able to provide a variety of types of coaching allowed me to expand my coaching skills. So I was quite familiar with individual coaching, felt really strong about that and, you know, could go in and do that, no problem. Whereas small group coaching was a little bit newer to me and um, an area where I could do some growing. So I was, you know, learning how to effectively prepare for those small group meetings, um, facilitating those, kind of figuring those pieces out. And actually, um, when I was had a small group, we were across a couple different childcare sites in one city. Um, and this was pre-pandemic, but we decided to use Zoom as our method of connecting. Um, so turns out I used a, I learned a really, really valuable skill um, in that setting um, because we just didn't have the drive time. Um, I think for the communication piece, 
really asking practitioners what's the best way to communicate with them. Oftentimes we're working with folks who are in the classroom all day long. And so really being able to be responsive of how they can get and, and um, respond to information is really helpful, whether that's an email or a text message or a communication app or um, you know sending some communication through their director who can come in and out of the classrooms, figuring out what's gonna be effective for each practitioner. Um, and then as far as like the organizational piece, I think really figuring out what strategies are effective for you as a coach. So maybe it's keeping track of all of the details in a document and it all stays in one spot. Maybe it's using a really detailed calendar. Um, I can, you know, individualizing and deciding what's best for you. But I do suggest um, scheduling group coaching meetings in advance, having that protected time on your calendar and on practitioners calendars. Um, and then making sure you have time in your, your schedule to be flexible with the individual coaching so you, that you can come on different days and different times of days um, and be responsive to the various goals um, that'll come up and needs that come up as far as setting those um, debrief and reflection meetings. Yeah, I mean, I know how we always hear from our coaches just, and those being coached, how it can feel time intensive. So. I could understand it's probably really important to have a written organizational system or however works best for you um, to keep yourself organized. And for me, it probably would even be just making sure I was following up with those who were self-coaching <laughs> to make sure, you know, they didn't fall off um, my radar. <laughs> and that's a great point, Ashley, that something that we, um, we do is we have kind of regular calendar reminders for sending out just like a, not even the, the meeting email, but just a like, hey, how are you doing? New kids in the classroom. Some of you might, as coaches might know this, we were kind of outside coaches, so we wouldn't know information about like, are there new kids in your classroom, new staff members? How's that training going? Just kind of in addition to the action planning check-in points, just learning about like making sure we've got a good view on what's happening in their classroom since we don't get to go in there and see exactly all the time what that looks like. So yeah, that, that reminder of that self-guided coaching is really important for maintaining those relationships. Um, thank you, Jenny. Uh, yeah, I know I would, I would definitely need that. I have alerts all over the place for myself. <laughs> um, so Mackenzie, this next questions also for you. Do you have any tips or insights on how to share um, about creating effective and positive coaching relationships with each educator, regardless of what type of coaching they're receiving? And I think that's a really good follow-up to what we were just talking about. Yeah, it can be challenging when you've got the different types of coaching and you've got lots of different practitioners you're working with. But I think figuring out how are you going to get to know each practitioner, learn a little bit about them, learn about what they're passionate about, what they're excited about, um, some of their experiences. I think as you know, when we're doing individual coaching and you're meeting with practitioners one on one, that's that's easier, right? Like that can fit into your conversations pretty easily. Um, I think. It, it poses a little bit more of a challenge when you're doing the small group coaching. And so you have to be, I think, a little more intentional about setting aside that time and space to get to know each other while also still trying to get a bunch of other things done. Um, and then when you're doing self-coaching, that's challenging because um, sometimes you're just doing emailing back and forth as, as check-ins, um, especially if you're an outside coach and you're not in the program. But really getting to know those little bits of pieces and, and finding ways to remember those. And then sharing a little bit about your own experiences and a little bit about yourself so you can find those connections and start building those relationships. And I like to, Jenny was talking about like some of those more kind of sometimes generic check-ins of like, you know, we always kind of want to know if there's new children, if there's something that's changed in the program or new staff, like we always want to know those pieces. Um, if you can individualize in some of those communications, pulling in something you know about that practitioner, um, about the classroom, um, asking those follow-up questions, uh, and also then sharing maybe some information or resources that are relevant to what's going on in that classroom, the goal that was set, um, kind of things that the practitioner is interested in really helps kind of make that connection. And then really drawing in when we learn about practitioners' interests, their strengths, their passions, pulling those, those things into the coaching cycle. Um, so for example, I had a, a practitioner I was working with once who was 
really creative, really enjoyed making paper artwork. Um, and she set a goal around creating a visual schedule. And as we were kind of setting this goal, we were talking about the important components of visual schedules and how it's useful to all children in the classroom. Um, we were kind of talking about like how it would be made and the different options of taking pictures and using clip art and all these things. And um, what she landed on making was these, um, she cut out like the outline shape of different things that represented the different parts of the day and then put them on a contrasting color. And so she made this really beautiful visual schedule that pulled in her interests um, and her passion around um, kind of artwork while also still meeting kind of all the needs that the children had for the visual schedule. And that was really fun to kind of pull those things together. I love that. And, you know, yeah, drawing on their interests because I think, you know, and my background working with families um, and doing family coaching, um, it really helps just to motivate and work towards their goals and, and not necessarily feel like work. <laughs> she probably really enjoyed doing that. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Shauna, uh, what type, what tips do you have for creating or supporting positive relationships among educators participating and coaching together? Um, yeah, thanks. I, I was listening to what Mackenzie was saying and thinking that this is such a nice follow-up to that because um, I feel like this speaks so much to because some of that small group work. Because um, I feel like when we're doing coaching, um, you know, first off, I'd say the, the people who are going through the more self-guided coaching, you know, we don't have as many, you know, as much time with them really to, to have those conversations. Um, so that can feel like uh, it takes a little bit more effort or um, connections on our part. And when we're doing that more individualized coaching, you know, where we have that regular time with them, you know, on a weekly basis, typically we can talk about, you know, our weekends or talk about their goals or, uh, you know, have some conversations based on, you know, what they were doing before and how they're moving forward and help them make those connections. But with a small group coaching, I found that supporting those relationships within the group was so essential um, and really positioning like myself as, you know, someone who's there to guide. I would provide the, the materials, give those presentations that Jenny was talking about, but to really emphasize the fact that, um, that it's about them and it's about like their work together and their problem solving. And they bring a lot of expertise to the groups. They bring a lot of their own experiences, their own resources and, um, and just letting that happen uh, was really powerful. So kind of to build off of Mackenzie's example, you know, if we were in the small group context, um, somebody might be thinking about how they're gonna create their visuals and, um, you know, depending on the group, because some groups are going to click very well. And I think, it, you know, it's going to depend to uh, all of the people I worked with were different from different programs. But, you know, for some groups, it might uh, be helpful to kind of guide the conversation a little bit, um, asking some questions, you know, what do you think? I wonder what would be a good solution. I wonder what are some options uh, for, you know, finding a particular material for that visual support. So sometimes facilitating those conversations really casually can be helpful, but I feel like once they get off and running, you know, um, my most recent group, it was almost like, you know, I was in the way sometimes because they'd be so excited to share like, hey, check it out. This is what I've done. Um, and again, these were all on Zoom too, but you know, they've got their laptop, they're running to the other side of the room and they're showing like, this is the visual. I just made it like last week and showing the different sides. And they all came up with some really great ideas and we're so excited to share and we're so excited to receive from each other too. Um, so I think, you know, just really creating that space and making sure that you really highlight and emphasize how much they have to share with each other. Um, that just really helps to build the relationships and also being, you know, casual, I find in terms of um, being able to bring a bit of small talk in at the beginning as time allows. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes if a little bit more help is needed, making some positive connections, like helping to make some just positive observations like, oh, I noticed you have that in the classroom. Oh, so-and-so, 
you have that in the classroom too, or, you know, we were talking, you mentioned this last week, um, just to kind of, you know, help them make those connections. And sometimes just thinking about um, what are some of the strategies that we use with children? Um, just bringing those in can be really helpful when, when we're working with adults too. So, um, you know, having yeah. those conversations. I'm glad you said that, Shauna, because as you were talking in that last example, it almost sounded like, you know, you were kind of bringing two friends together, like, hey, I noticed you did this and you did this. Do you want to talk about it? Um, and I know how effective even just taking time, even with my own team, doing a quick little icebreaker in the beginning of a meeting um, has been so helpful in just getting to know each other more on a personal level and not talk shop all the time. And that can really go a long way too. Um, so I love all those, those tips that you shared. Um, Mackenzie, I have another question for you. Um, and this is talking about the matching process because I think, um, you know, I've heard Jenny and her team talk about uh, tier coaching model and it's always like, well, what if the teachers aren't happy with what they get matched with? Um, so how do you approach communicating with teachers about the type of coaching that they've been matched with? Yeah, it can be a little tricky. Um, I think I've, I've used the email for like the initial coach placement letter, which has, you know, that information about the placement and like a little bit of the, sh the short explanation, a little bit of some information. I think really helping teachers understand what the options are, what, what the model is, what's the intention kind of before you even get started is really helpful. And sometimes reiterating those pieces, um, really ensuring, I think that's one of the trickiest pieces is really ensuring folks don't feel like it is punitive at all or something that they need to be working towards a different type of coaching. Mm -hmm. So I like to have some follow-up conversations um, with practitioners to ensure they're comfortable with the placements that they've received um, and working through any challenges that might come up or um, you know, questions or requests for something different. So um, I've gotten questions about like, just tell me a little bit more. And a lot of practitioners or like, great, that sounds good. Um, but every once in a while, it's not great. So um, I had one practitioner who was originally um, placed in self-coaching. Um, she reached out and requested individual coaching. So she and I met and we talked about her needs and kind of why she had this request for, for a different um, kind of coaching uh, type. And she talked a lot about how there was a child um, in her classroom that was engaging in some perceived challenging behavior. Um, she also had some other classroom wide practices that she was wanting to work on that she knew would, um, you know, be supportive of this child and some of the other children. And ultimately, she just identified that individual coaching would be a better fit for her learning style. So we made that that shift. Um, this was partway through the year, kind of at that check in point, she had been doing self coaching coaching, shifted over to individual coaching. Um, and with that, uh, we were able to kind of go through the PVC cycles together and provide her that additional support that she was looking for. Um, and in the end, that ended up being really successful for her. So I think just checking back in and having those conversations and, and ensuring that we are kind of meeting the needs of the teachers, that kind of feels so good to be that responsive. Yeah, I love how in, in your framework, you have those check-in points created so that changes can be made. Um, and it sounds like it was neat. She was able to kind of stick through and try the self-coaching before she was like, yes, definitely. <laughs> Next round, we're doing this in the more intensive. Um, Shauna, um, what types of coaching had you done before? Um, your experience with your coaching model um, and any maybe type of coaching that you prefer since engaging in the tier coaching model um, and how is the tier coaching model different in your perspective from your coaching experience prior? Yeah, I've held a few different coaching positions. I've coached the teacher candidates in our master's program at University of Washington. Um, I do some coaching right now with uh, K through five pair educators working with autistic students. Um, and that's more of a manual that we follow. Um, and then also for my own research, for my dissertation, I coached um, early intervention practitioners in a set of caregiver coaching strategies. So 
it's been really interesting having that TCM coaching experience was somewhere in the middle of all of those. And I did it over uh, a few years. So it's definitely overlapped. And I'm, I mean, I would say, and probably what's, what's kind of clear, obvious is it's different in the way that it's so responsive, that there are, you know, these opportunities to really um, match coaching to what practitioners um, need or want, and then being able to change that. So it's very dynamic. So for instance, when I, when I was doing that coaching with early intervention practitioners around coaching strategies, it was more static. You know, there was one um, style of coaching offered and I had already done TCM coaching at that point. And I remember thinking at some point like, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could, you know, maybe after a few weeks be able to check in and say like, hey, let's adjust the level of coaching that you're receiving because um, some practitioners I think could have used uh, more or um, even wanted more time and more connection and more reflection and all of that. Whereas others um, may have been more successful or felt like it was a better use of their time to um, really approach it more independently and just touch bases as needed. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's something that I, I really find myself thinking about a lot in all of the different coaching roles that I'm taking on now. Yeah. And you bring up something really important there. And what you just said, Shauna was that, is that, um, intensive coaching isn't necessary for everybody or just that knowledge that at some point, not, you know, even if they start with intensive coaching, that there are other options out there and for them to still work on their professional development in that way. Um, so it sounds like maybe TCM kind of helps you to become really intuitive with realizing, you know, what supports individual practitioners need um, throughout their professional development. Uh, so that's really neat. Um, and I just wanted to follow up with one more. Um, what did you like most about your experience coaching with the tiered coaching model? And what did you feel was most, most difficult? So I'll start off with Shauna and then Mackenzie, you can hop into. Great. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I might sound a little bit like a broken record here, but what I really liked was the responsiveness, right? Being able to, to, have those different opportunities and really meet practitioners or teachers where they were at. Um, and I really, I, re, I just meet for myself. I really enjoyed the small group coaching too. It was so fun to watch edu um, practitioners build relationships with each other and really take up that space um, and share. So that was really fun. In terms of most difficult, I mean, I think which is about anything we're talking about, it's it's time and scheduling, right? It's some of those logistics. So again, you know, all of our small group, um, the practitioners within that were at different programs. So finding one hour or so, 45 minutes, even each week, um, or even every two weeks that people were routinely available was somewhat different. And, you know, that's gonna look different if you're just working within your program. Um, but some people took off Wednesdays or Fridays. So having that time and scheduling, um, and you know, that can really impact the character of the group too. So thinking ahead of time, what am I going to do if say for the small group coaching, um, they, you know, only one person can show up, you know, so coming up with a plan, what, what am I going to do then? Is it going to be more individualized? Do we reschedule? Um, so just some of those time and scheduling logistics. Mm -hmm. What about for you, Mackenzie? I mean, same for what I liked most about the coaching with that responsiveness and being able to really just meet needs um, in a more effective way. Absolutely. Uh, hardest part for me, I think, was normalizing that there are various levels of coaching and, and that it's that it's expected that you do change in and out of different types like that's just part of of the model um and ensuring that that practitioners didn't feel that that was punitive in any any form um because it is 
it is different, right? Like we don't usually change up how people are coached midpoint through the year um, or have kind of these this tiered level of coaching. And so just um, having those conversations and, and um, normalizing that this is that we will be responding to your needs and your needs will potentially change throughout the year or year to year. And that's that's OK. Did either of you get any feedback from those that you coached about their experiences with tiered coaching model? you know, how they felt receiving it. I mean, I would say I, it was a lot of positive feedback mm -hmm. in terms of that. Um, there was one practitioner in particular that had been doing the individualized coaching that we'd been meeting every week. Um, and I, you know, we did our, our check-in after a certain number of weeks and she kind of jumped right down to the self-guided coaching. And I really anticipated having that conversation with her that she was going to say like, you know, no, I, I have more than I'm interested in, or we were working on this, but she was like, great, um, ready to go. You know, I'm sure she appreciated having some time back, but, um, so for that too, you know, she, she just had positive feedback to say about that process. And, um, you know, being able to be flexible in that way. Yeah. It must, had any, oh, sorry, Ashley. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, it must feel like they have a choice in the process. It must really help with buy-in. I think so. And I think that, um, you know, on our experiences, especially with, I think really communicating to teachers that like, ultimately you have a pretty big say in what this is going to look like. Um, is is important and helps with that buy-in and i think you know i know from from talking to our teachers who at the end of our projects the beginning and end of our projects as i'm enrolling and closing them out in their participation with us um that there's a, a lot of reflection of like i was a little nervous when we started and then when i saw what it felt like that it really was okay if I moved to different types of coaching, that it really was about the group, you know, when we were in a small group, it was about the group working together on this, or it felt really exciting. It did feel right to have somebody coming in for just a little while. And then it, it really was okay when I moved to small, when I moved to small group coaching or to, um, into, into, into um, self-guided coaching. And so I think that, um, somebody asked a question about how do you prep teachers um, who are who are new, who might have experienced different types of coaching and they're new to your program. And I think what Mackenzie described is as normalizing the process of moving within and among um, the the the, um, the the levels or tiers, however you communicate about it and giving really clear intros and information about what exactly it looks like along with the information that this is the framework but this is a partnership. And so we're, you know, we you might be doing individualized coaching, but what that looks like for you and I as a coaching partnership is going to be unique than it is for you and the person who's down the hall. And so really giving a framework, explaining what coaching, coaching is going to look like, explaining when and why you might change into different um, types of coaching and that they have a lot of ownership over that process um, can really help um, guide that and, and help um, teachers feel more comfortable uh, with that process because it is unique and different and it is a little like I'm getting this and my next door neighbor that I share a bathroom our classroom share a bathroom but we're getting something totally different and and that can feel strange and so really creating it as a whole program way of thinking about we're all getting everybody what they need want prefer um, can be really helpful I love that and I could talk about this with you all day <laughs> Um, I am looking forward to hearing more from you and your team as you know you unveil more research with it, um, and maybe we'll see it in other uh, you know program types of programs like family child care early intervention. Uh, but I'm gonna hand things off to Victor because time goes by and we um, are done for the day. So Victor, can you close us out? Yes, thank you so very much to our panelists for their wonderful insights. Your feedback is very important to the work that we do. Please remember to provide your feedback on this webinar with our post webinar survey by typing the web address or scanning the QR code shown on this slide into your internet browser or phone. Your certificate of attendance will appear once you submit the survey. 
We invite you to visit our website, challengingbehavior.org, to sign up for our upcoming webinars, access recordings, download pyramid model resources, and more. Thank you to our funder for making this webinar possible. This concludes our webinar. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.